Welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is Michael, Krista, and Laura here at the Nebraska Library Commission with Big Talk from Small Libraries 2015, year four. It is 1 p.m. Central Time, and just to do a little bit of housekeeping here, uh, if you've just joined us, if you have any uh, questions for our presenters, you can do that two ways. You can submit that those via the Q&A section of GoToWebinar, or we are monitoring Twitter with the hashtag BTSL. Uh, there is no active chat room in the software, so if you have comments or questions, uh, please submit them one of those two ways. We are recording the day, and we will be posting those recordings and all of our presenters' slides post the event, probably sometime next week. Um, and uh, that is uh, pretty much the housekeeping. So uh, our first uh, session of the afternoon is Pope Nobel, the director of the Tamarack District Library. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, talking about little free public libraries. Uh, welcome, Hope, and take it away. Thank you very much. I am really excited to be with all of you today, uh, partly because it's been a little while since I've gotten to talk about these little libraries, and this is the project of all the projects I've done so far in my professional career that I have loved to do the most. So I am excited to get to talk about it again. My name is indeed Hope Noble. And I'm going to give you just a little roadmap of what I will cover with you today. I will spend a little time on introductions. I'll talk about the goals of the project as we conceived it. I'll give you an overview of our timeline, our results, and then a brief takeaway for you. Um, and I chose this photo of this road because it is not straight. And with a project like this, one is likely to change direction a time or two. Uh, we certainly did. Also, it represents West Virginia quite well. And this project did take place in West Virginia. I was a library director for two years in the Jackson County area of West Virginia and thoroughly enjoyed it. That is where this project took place. I just recently relocated back to Kansas. So here's a little photo of myself. You might recognize this if you looked at the speaker bios. I trimmed it down for the headshot, but I did want to just actually let you see the full photo, partly so you would know why I had that goofy expression on my face, and partly because Archives Grand Rapids is going to come up again later in the presentation. Uh, and it was part of my inspiration for a piece of this project, so I thought that was a good piece to include. Um, I want to introduce you to the Jackson County Public Library. I think it's very important to librarianship to understand that not all libraries are the same, uh, not all communities are the same. And a good library, in my view, which I'm sure many of you would share, reflects the community that it serves. And so I want to give you a picture of this community, because without the community and the fabric that underlay this library, this project would never have happened. This is also the first step that we took along the road of this project. I gave this presentation to every community group I could find in the Jackson County area in the fall of 2013. It was the first time that many of those organizations had ever heard a lot of these details about the library. It gave them a whole new view of the library as well as introducing them to me. I was a new librarian at that point. And uh, it was an incredibly useful tool to lay the groundwork for this reason for this project. So let me just walk you through it very briefly. Oh, that's not what was supposed to happen. Hang on. There we go. Sorry about that. Many people don't even know how a library is organized. We know because we're librarians. But that was useful in our presentation. And I do want to talk just briefly about these funding sources because I made it a point to go to each of the organizations that gives funding to the library and give them this presentation. Um, it is also important to just briefly mention, when we began this project, there was no money in my budget to pay for a project. So I had to come up with something that didn't require a library funds, and I was successful in doing that. And I'm sure that that is a challenge many of you will 
and our patient as well. As we continue to go through some of this, I do want to say it's fun to brag on a library. That's another reason that I enjoy giving this presentation. It's fun to just kind of look and see what it is that the library is all about and take a step back and say, oh, this is what we accomplished. This is what the statistics were. I pulled almost everything from this presentation from the state report that I had to do anyway. Um, you all have to do state reporting. So rather than let all of that work go to waste, I found a way to kind of put it out. Oh? Uh -huh. And yeah. yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Could, is there any way you can get a little closer to your microphone or getting a little... Uh, and, okay. Is this better? Uh, yes. Yeah, that should do. Thank you. Okay. I will try to keep my voice up. I tend to speak quite softly. Interestingly enough, that was something that I heard quite often in these presentations as well. So I will, I will do my best. And if it comes up again, just please drop a note and let me know. Um, this, this library, this small library in West Virginia, serves an incredible number of people. It is absolutely integral to their community. And you can see from the numbers that my staff worked very, very hard indeed. I count this as a small library because we had two locations. Even though our service population was larger than a small library we typically have, the two branches served primarily their towns. So Ripley and Ravenswood, and we'll see that in a moment, were served by this. Um, and they, even though they were part of a county system, a two-branch county system, they functioned very individually because even within those two towns, they were very different. Um, and so each branch had a different flavor. And I tried to be very respectful of that as the director of the system support. Uh, let me just kind of keep going through some of this information. Some of it's relevant to what we're talking about today. Some of it's not. Some of it's just by way of interest. But it was all interesting to people from the community. Now, this is something that I want us to look at more closely. Uh, when I came to Jackson County, within the first week that I was there, I got a call. I barely knew how to find my phone, but I, I was able to answer the phone. And I hadn't learned much else, but I had learned that much. And I was asked by the gentleman on the other line if I had a literacy program, if there was a way for me to learn how to read and I put them on hold and asked my staff, and they said, no, there isn't anything like that in the county. So I got back on and I said, uh, sir, we're working on a literacy initiative. Can I call you back when we've got something in place? And I started working on it. That became one of the major goals of my time here as a group. And that was one of the reasons that we began the library initiative. Was it was something that we had support the concept of literacy and the culture of literacy in the community of which we were a part. I want to talk to you now about those little free libraries because I think um, it's important for you to know a little bit more about what we're, what we're looking for. And that was something that I also introduced in that presentation. Let me go to the little free library website here and just take a little brief look around. Forgive me if you are already familiar with the concept, but I don't want to keep talking about it without giving a little bit of overview for those who do not know about it. This is what I did um, when I first became familiar with Little Free Libraries. I heard about it, um, read about it briefly. I went on the website and I looked around. I spoke with the executive director, Todd Bull and asked him if there was any reason why we could not, as a public library, use this idea. And he said, no, it's a free country. Go ahead. In fact, he became very excited about it. And we'll talk about that more in a little while. He was very generous to our project. So this is, this is um, what is a little free library? Why are they valuable? Uh, the, focus of Little Free Libraries is, in fact, community literacy, which meant that it was a perfect fit for what I was going to do with the literacy initiative. 
the ways to get involved were listed. And this became a wonderful, wonderful resource for me as I began to plan the project. And I talked with the cities and the township about their zoning laws. I worked through uh, ways to build the library. I <laughs> heavily, heavily leaned upon this, find someone locally to build one for you that's suggested here. I found ways to build support within the community. I worked through the steps that are on this page, although I may not have done it in exactly the order that they gave, because my project was somewhat unique. Uh, the little libraries, I'll just answer this question right away, because I think it might come up later, are not yet registered on the map, but they will be at one point. And there are some community stories that are part of how that all came together. Um, Plans and Tips for Library Builders also was an excellent resource for me. How to build the level libraries. Rules about the design. There are no rules. I was able to keep it very open. There are blueprints and measurements for builders. And I did go on here as I was beginning to promote this to the community. And I printed this plan in just a simple double-sided format and started to distribute that. So we'll see more about that later. It gives you just a small taste of what's available on that website, and I'll let you all go and look at that more as you choose to in the future. I want to talk a little bit about the timeline. And this would be different for different libraries, but I began those community presentations in September of 2013. I had been in the community for just about exactly a year at that point. So I was in a place where I understood and had connections with the community. And I also understood my library well enough that I thought I could go and I could represent it and, and give it for a picture. It helped that I knew members of the community. It helped a lot that I had been and was active as a member in a lot of community organizations. Again, different projects are going to fit different libraries, uh, different communities will engender different ideas. And in West Virginia, there's such a strong focus on workmanship. The artisan community is very active. And that resonates. You, even with those who are not themselves artisans, it's a part of the Appalachian culture to an extent that was very helpful. It was also helpful that this was a small southern town with really, I think it was just about every club or organization known to man. And as the library director, I was asked to join all of those clubs. And I became a member of all these different organizations. I was a member of the Rotary and of the Alliance Club, of the Women's Club, and the Pilots Club. I got to know the local officials of various levels and ranks. And all of those connections became very helpful because as I went and presented to all of those organizations and to the city councils and to the school board and all of these different organizations, they knew me a little, but they got to know me more. And they knew me enough by that time to know that I was someone who would see a project through. And I can't tell you how exciting it was for me when I got my first sponsor check in November. It was just exhilarating and so exciting. And I will, as you see on here, you see these lists of these different entities. I, as I presented, I told people that I had broken this down into five worlds. My concern, and I think this is important for us to think about, um, my concern is that if I presented this project, it would seem too overwhelming for most people to consider the entire piece, to consider uh, paying for materials, and building a library, and decorating a library, and hosting a library, and then being the person responsible to maintain that library. And so I broke it down into those five different roles of sponsor, builder, artist, host and steward, and I made it very, very clear in the media that I generated 
that an individual or a company could commit to one or all, any, any variation of any of the pieces in order to be a part of this project. And I really think that that was one of the reasons that it was as successful as it was, because that check came in. I had presented all of the roles, and said, you can take on any of the roles. But the people to whom I was presenting, the business people and the leaders in the community, they weren't people who maybe had the ability to go out and build something, or the time to go out and build something, but they could write a check for something that they were convinced was a good thing. And once I had that money in my library's uh, projects line for this project, I knew that I had what I needed to pay for any costs that came on later that were not covered by volunteers. Uh, the sponsorship amount was $100, and that was intended to cover the uh, registration on the Little Free Library website and incidental installation costs. And as I envisioned the project, everything else would be donated by volunteers. So, that's a little bit about sponsors, and I got those checks coming in, and I was excited. And then I thought, well, okay, now I need to really push for a building. So I looked around, and I, I took some time to try to find different organizations and so on, and I talked to them, and, and those discussions did eventually bear fruit. Different people that I spoke with did eventually take part in the project. But uh, that connection to your library patrons is invaluable with something like this. And my first little free library was actually built for me in December by a gentleman who came in. I had never seen him before. He had heard that it was possible to get things printed at the library, and he was working on a reporting project. He was retired, and he just came in and he said, "Can you find me some pictures of I'm trying to think what it was? Even I think it was a maybe it was a gingerbread house." And I said, sure, you know, I can find the pictures of that. So I found some pictures, and I was talking with him, and I said, so you like to build things out of wood. Well, how would you like to maybe build them in these little libraries? And I gave him the sheet that I had made up to talk about the project, and he took it, and he said, well, I'll think about it. And he went away. He came back uh, about a week and a half later, carrying a little queer library on a post ready to display in the library. It was built like a gingerbread house, and he was wearing a Santa Claus hat. And I was so thrilled and happy. So uh, that was my first builder. And then builders started coming in, and money started coming in. And in February, there was so much buzz in the, in the area, in the community, so many people asking about it, that I thought, you know, I think that I need to use this for more than just supporting literacy and reaching out to community, I, I think I need to actually maybe display these little libraries somehow. And then I remembered how Art Prize was put together, Art Prize Grand Rapids, if you would call that photo of me at this, at this art rental. I want to show you the document that I came up with for this, oh, hang on, I'll just go through it. Here it is. I put this document together to tell people a little bit about how the project came together and what was happening with it. And I went out and I talked with different corporate uh, entities and got soft promises for corporate sponsorships and designed an art contest so that people would know that they could donate the little libraries to the library, um, but that it would be an opportunity also for them to win cash prizes. And what I eventually got together was a $1,000 prize from one of the largest employers in the county, from Scallion, a $250 prize from SDR Plastics, another larger business in the area, and then uh, actually a community building group that hadn't yet committed when I printed this up way back in April also did donate $250. It was, it was interesting to design this contest. I had never done anything like it before, but I, I found that the project, and this is one of those turns in the road that I talked about, 
I found that the project began to take on a life of its own. And if these little libraries were going to be of the quality that I hoped they would be, I needed to find a way to, to recognize that and have that be recognized in the community. And this, this was what I came up with to do that. And it was very useful and it was very helpful and it worked as I hoped it would. So that was when the idea for the art contest came together, but it wasn't until April that I finally got my sponsors and got the word out about it. Uh, we got the little libraries in in June, and then we displayed them in July. We gave the prizes out at a big party in July. And by that time, I was getting more requests for people who wanted to host the little libraries, and also more requests for people who wanted to be students. My deadline to get all of the hosts and the students was September because I wanted them to be installed in October. And they were, in fact, installed in October. And I'm going to give you a couple of little pictures of how this looked and how this worked. Um, we're going to go to the Jackson County Public Library Facebook site and let you see how that started to come together. So first, the outreach libraries. Um, with all their fascinating beauty. We ended up with 25 of them. And I want to take a little time to walk through them because as this project came together, one of the things that came out of it uh, that I did not foresee was this just incredible, incredible opportunity to build community. I cannot tell you how many people said in the course of the summer and the fall that they had no idea that there was this kind of talent in the county. And the, the pride and the solidarity and the community spirit that that built was just a remarkable thing to see. It was really, really neat. So we have these different entries. And uh, you'll see there's a number over here um, on the description, number 87556. Each of the entries was assigned a number and the voting was done by text. I won't talk too much more about that, but if anybody has questions, I can give you more information about how I put that together. That, again, was patterned after what I had seen with Art Prize Grand Rapids, which is an art contest on a much larger scale than this was, but it's, it's what gave me the idea. This young lady was a volunteer at the library and wanted to do a decorate one. These folks were a, a school teacher in the area and her father. They built this together as her gift to him for Father's Day. This beautiful little library was built with stones and um, all hand decorated. She polished the stones, put everything together. This was my first little library, one that came in the door with the gentleman dressed like Santa Claus. It's a gingerbread house. And it's charming, I think. This little library was built and hosted by a church. This was one entity who chose to do all five pieces. Uh, they wanted to do it all. So they gave the money, they built it, they decorated it. And as a matter of fact, inside, you can't see it in this photo, but they had cut apart their church directory, all the photos, and put the photos inside the little library. So it's like that little rhyme um, in your childhood. Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door, see all the people. And that I thought was very clever. Another beautiful and artistically designed little library. One of my friends from Pilots Club had a uh, brother who, in his retirement, chose to work with stained glass. And I knew that. So I asked her to talk to him and see if he would incorporate stained glass into a little free library. And he did indeed do that. This charming little gingerbread house type of library was made by one of the local reporters, who then, because she was involved in the project, gave even more focus to covering it in the library. I'll just sort of go through a few more. This one's a very large little library, the largest one I've seen. This was made by a family member of one of my library staff. 
one of the high school art classes made this one. This won the high school art prize. Another gingerbread house. A Tetris library. This was a team who wanted to get involved. And I want to talk a little bit more about this one because this is a little library that was built and decorated by a Boy Scout who came alongside in the spring. Um, I did present to the Boy Scouts in the fall as one of the community organizations, and the Boy Scout leaders said, oh, this would be a really good Eagle Scout, Eagle Scout project. And I said, well, yes, it would. So this young man wanted to do an Eagle Scout project, and he came to me and said, what can I do? And I said, this project has become enormous, so detailed, there's so much going on, uh, and would you be able to see about getting maybe 10 little libraries built and so that I can pass them on to artists to decorate for this art contest? And he said yes. So he ended up coordinating, uh, getting actually 12 little free libraries built, just rough, basic, using the plans I had given them. The high school shop classes built them for me. And um, then we were able to pass them on to the artists, and they decorated them. This was decorated in memory of a young lady's grandmother's friend. And was very touching. And the Dr. Seuss Little Library, which of course is near and dear to the heart of every librarian, I think. So there you are. That's just a brief overview of what some of the little libraries looked like. So we had all the little libraries. We had them on display. They were voted on. The art contest prizes were handed out. This was all very exciting. It raised all kinds of buzz. There was uh, a lot of coverage in the media. We got on television and radio and in the newspaper. I had mentioned that the executive director of Little Free Libraries was excited about this. He was extra excited when he found out how many we were putting in in the community. He was the one who told me, it looks to me like you'll have more little libraries in your, in your county than in the whole rest of the state of West Virginia, which was sort of fun. And then that became buzz too, of course, because everybody likes to think that their community is just a little more special than anybody else's. And again, uh, that was part of building a strong sense of community spirit. So I'm going to go now to installation. Uh, the Boy Scouts did become wonderful partners on this project. And in great part, because they just simply had some of the skills that I needed. And they like to do projects like this. So this gentleman who was a friend of mine from Rotary, you'll, you'll notice these, all these community connections from being out in the community, said, yeah, I'll come and pick up the rest of your little libraries, and we'll get them installed. We'll do it all in one day. So they built the frames for installation. He came and picked them up. They looked pretty funny. We got some very strange looks from some people. And there were one or two people who even stopped and said, are you stealing the libraries from the, from the library? I said, no, I'm the library director. This is what's supposed to happen with them. This is a new concept in the community. Uh, most people had not heard about it. And many people, I discovered when we got to this point in the project, actually thought that we had built these little libraries just to keep them in our library, which of course wasn't the purpose at all. So when they realized these were getting installed and when they saw them out in the community, they became very, very excited. I was kind of skimmed through this. Uh, you see, this is the... Um, frame that they built. They built this according to notes on the Little Free Library website. Again, these materials were donated. I had gotten that sponsorship money, if you recall, and it was this sort of thing that that money was supposed to cover, but in the end I didn't need to use it because so many organizations were so generous that I didn't need to pay for some of those things as I had thought I would. So there they are doing a very workmanlike, excellent job. These boys had a great time doing it. Drilling it into place, taking off the protective covering, and there it is. And incidentally, that law firm, Adams Fisher and Chapel, uh, Rob Fisher, his name is there on the sign, 
He was a friend from Rotary who wrote me that first sponsorship check. And it's good to remember those special people who give you that first little step along the road. He got the Hansel and Gretel Library because it fit the best with his building. And when he wrote the check, he said he wanted to host one. So I was, I was sure to honor that. I'll talk a little bit more in a little while about um, how that process worked for matching up hosts with the little libraries, but that was just so much fun to find just the right spot for each little library. This was that first library that was donated. The mayor of the city of Ripley was so touched by that story that she said, I don't, I, I, I don't want any other little library. I want that little library because I think that's so special that that man did that for you. So I said, all right, you can have that little library, and that's the one in front of Tom Hall, and that's the mayor there. With her blue and bling, it's a Viking thing. That's the high school football team. This, if you look on the window there, the Jackson County Community Foundation did give a grant to the library to administrate this program, this project. And they said they wanted to host. So I said, all right, you can host. Let's see what one looks best by you. And we wanted something that was colorful and would catch people's eye as they went by. And so that's the one that we picked for in front of the Community Foundation building. And this is another team of Boy Scouts. We had four teams of Boy Scouts go out in one day and installed, I want to say, 16 of these all at once. It was incredible. And wow, did that get the buzz going. And then this little library, the one that was designed in memory of the grandmother's friend, was put in front of the family eating place in Ravenswood. Again, those, those community connections are what make these little free libraries special. And it was really cool to see that come together. And then this was just the very best place for this little lighthouse. This is the Ohio River, which runs past the city of Ravenswood. And this is in the city of Ravenswood Park. I hope I haven't spent too much time dwelling on those photos, but I, I just want to reiterate that fabric of the community that underlies a project like this is what makes it successful. And to see those connections form is what really makes it exciting to actually do. So our project goals. When we initially talked about this project, my board and I, we said, we want to expand library services to all of the county. We have two locations. It's a large county. Um, the outlying areas don't have services. And it's hard for people to drive in, especially those who have lower income. And how can we find a way to get out to them? We knew we didn't have money for a bookmobile. We knew we didn't have money to build another location of the more traditional kind. Um, but we wanted to find a way to do it. And as I said, one of the primary goals of my role there as library director was to build literacy initiatives in the county. And those two things came together into the Little Free Library Project. And then that third element that you see there, the community building, I don't know if I should call that a goal because, honestly, that wasn't something that I foresaw being a part of this. But I'm adding it because it was definitely the third outcome and became greater than the sum of its parts in many ways. I need to just take a little drink here a moment, if you'll excuse me, and I'm going to let you read down this. You see the list of participation. You see the different pieces of the puzzle as they came together. And you see what I found to be um, a simply overwhelming amount of generosity and open-heartedness in the community. Uh, we, see, we see a total here of $8,600 that was donated 
to make this project a possibility. And much of that did not need to be spent. Now, of course, 3,500 of it is in kind, so that didn't actually go into the library's bank account. But that still leaves us with a considerable amount of money that was available to administrate. And that money um, is still there, and it's still being used to keep this going. Um, there were not a lot of costs involved with the building and installation and uh, all of those other pieces that I foresaw possible costs. But there will be ongoing costs in years to come of just keeping these little libraries up, maintenance costs. Um, it will even be possible to use that money to purchase specific books, um, which I, when I began this project, did not think was even possible. So I guess I set my sights too low. Uh, but one of the things I was able to do was stock these little libraries, not only with donated books, which was the original idea, donated books and weeded books from the collection, but I was able also to purchase some new books that were specifically related to literacy, um, both adult literacy and beginning or children's literacy. And that, that was wonderful. Uh, there's a library director now there who is doing a wonderful job, and he will find ways to use that money to support this project, I'm sure. But it, it was really wonderful to be able to hand this over and say, look, you know, we've got these 25 little satellite locations all around the county, um, and enjoy, have fun, and here's money to help administrate that's not coming out of the library budget. I think we've been to this photo album already, so I'm going to just kind of keep coming along here. This is, this is the takeaway that I want to give you. And I was concerned about running out of time. I think I'm actually ahead of time. I must talk faster than I realize. So I'll take a few minutes to talk about this, and then I can take questions. I do have um, other documents that I used as I built this project. It was multifaceted. There were a lot of pieces. So I'll be able to give you lots more information, but I also want to hear your questions so that we can be a little bit interactive. Um, I am going to sum up some of the lessons that I learned from this project by simply saying the best library is the one that reflects its community. And to see the ways in which all these elements of the community interacted with the library and the positive results that came from that was incredibly inspiring. Um, on this little diagram that I have here, I have the library director at the center, not because I think that the library director is the most important piece of the puzzle. In many ways, I think I was the least important piece of the puzzle, and yet I was, I functioned, I guess you could say, as the one piece that was connected to all the other pieces. And there were times that that um, made me uh, maybe feel a little bit like I was being pulled in a few extra directions, but it was worth it. And having that connection, uh, thoroughly understanding the mission of the library, having an excellent working relationship with my library board, which was a wonderful library board anyway, um, understanding the resources that we had available at the library, having a good connection with my staff and knowing that I could depend upon them, and then that connection with the library users, that all enabled me to understand the community better and to go out into the community and make those connections in the community that made this a success. So I just can't, can't emphasize enough for something like this. That's what's going to be needed. And it was incredibly rewarding and just really good for that. So I will Happily take questions at this point and uh, find other ways to give you more information if we run out of questions. Yeah, thank you, Hope. Uh, I know we have a couple questions uh, that have come in from the audience. I want to say, though, that I think those you wondered if, if you showed too many photos. No, 
Um, those are absolutely amazing photos. There's, we're all just sitting here looking at those going, wow. And then when you finally saw a, a person standing next to them, you really got the size of those things. Um, that, that, those, are, those are quite impressive. Uh, so, Laura, we got a couple questions from the audience? We do, and here we have a comment. Our group loved the photos, they hey. say. So <laughs> there you go. Um, somebody would like to hear a little bit more about how you decided where to put the libraries. Oh, sure. Um, I wonder if we can just uh, bring you to... Sorry, this is a little strange to the eyes. Okay. I'm going to just bring you to what I call the brain of the project. This was my Excel spreadsheet. Um, you'll see that I have some lines hidden here between E and J, some columns. That's, uh, that contained all of the address information and contact information. Mm -hmm. As I had people come to me and say, I'm interested in being a part of this. How can I be a part of it? I explained to them the different pieces you see here, the sponsor, builder, artist, host, steward. And you know, on my timeline, I had dates for these different things. Mm -hmm. I should explain that that represented sort of firsts and sort of deadlines. But all of that information was coming at me through that whole period of time. And so whenever I had somebody come to me, I had forms that I asked them to fill out. Uh, they, they had the information about the project on one side, and it had their personal information on the other side. And I just asked them to check, what piece of this do you want to be a part of? Sometimes they checked all, sometimes they checked two or three or however many you can see for yourself there under sponsor, builder, artist, host, steward. And then I entered their information in. And that's the only thing that enabled me to keep track of this, because it really did become pretty complex. But as time went by, to get more specifically to your question of the host, I looked at everybody that I had signed up who wanted to be a host. And I looked at the little libraries, and I drove around the county. And I'm, you know, I have some photos of that. If we have time, I might go to that and show you. I fell in love with Jackson County. I only lived there for two years and two months. And then I came back to Michigan because my family is here. But if it were not for my family being here, I could have stayed there forever. It is beautiful. And so as I drove around all these beautiful roads in this West Virginia hilly, green um, loveliness, I, I tried to locate places in addition to the people who had signed up I went out and I found places that maybe were um, intersections where, where a lot of traffic would come through or be high visibility, or places in the county that would be good, um, good, good places to encourage people to go and see. Sort of a couple of back roads, actually, I chose and found that had just these beautiful views. And unless you lived way up in that little holler, which is a real word in West Virginia, it's a real true word, um, unless you lived up in the holler, you would never see this beautiful view. And so I would ask permission, you know, can we put a little library here so that people can come out and see this and, and see how beautiful their county is? So um, I kind of comp compiled a list. And I, I do think, you know, I'm going to look just a little. You said there weren't too many photos. So um, I'm going to go. And I'm going to look at their albums and just see if I do have photos up on this website. I have a lot of my own as well. So I'm not sure if they're on the site here. It doesn't look like they are on the site. Um, but I did a big map of the county. And I had an intern help me. And that it was a map of the county, and it had this huge list of suggested locations. I think we had, at one point, over 40 suggested locations. And then I would ask people, I would say, do you think this would be a good location? Um, do you know somebody who might be able to help us get a library in this location? And as library patrons would come through and we would talk with them, we would get more ideas. And people would say, oh, you need to have one at the post office out in out in Cottageville, and I know the postmaster, and I'll talk to the postmaster, and I'd say, okay, great, thank you. And, and we did have an agreement as well for the hosts to sign. Um, 
And I would say, here, take this host agreement, and if they'll fill it out and get it back to me, that would be wonderful. So that was that was how I did that piece of ah. it. That kind of gives you uh, a picture of that when you go back to the Excel spreadsheet. Great, thanks. Um, somebody would like to know, how did the little libraries hold up through the wiener? Well, I, I told people that they needed basically two requirements. Uh, people who were thinking of building one would have questions, and I said, you know, here's, here's an example of the plans, but don't feel like you have to stick with the plans. I just need this to be able to withstand the elements in order to protect the books, and it needs to be something that can be installed in a public place. Those were the two things. I said, you do anything you want other than that. So um, they, they took that to heart. I did have a gentleman um, who is a builder by trade who was kind enough to go through all the little libraries when they were all on display. And he and I walked through them. And he examined them for structural soundness, for whether they would uh, withstand the elements. and made notes and I, I copied down what he told me and he, he actually took about half of them and sprayed them because he said the paint grade wasn't high enough or you know different things so he had a commercial sprayer and um, I reimbursed him for the, um, the materials that he needed but he sprayed them with a waterproofing agent that he said would protect them sufficiently so there were two that he said you know the way these are decorated are not, it's just not going to withstand the elements. And those two we found places to install that they would be protected. Um, and other than that, we you know, didn't really see any problems. So. Hmm. Um, so most of the little free library projects that I've uh, been familiar with are, are not actually connected to a library. You know, they're just some organization did one or a family did one. Do, do yours include any sort of indication that it's connected to the library in any way, inside or outside? Or, you know, if somebody was just coming through town, would they be able to tell that this was a, a, a project from the library itself? Yes. And how so? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they were originally intended to be outreach locations of the public library. And so I was very careful to keep that as part of the part of the, the fabric of the project. And we designed signs that listed the sponsor and the artist, and in some cases the builder, depending. But that also included standard text that said an outreach location of Jackson County Public Library. Um, we have somebody here who's interested in um, how how were the houses maintained? And I, I think what she's saying is, um, how often did you have to check them and like make sure that the books were, there were enough books in there and stuff? Sure. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this fifth uh, role, that of the steward. Uh, the steward's task was, and, and is, because presumably that's still going on, um, to check each location, or to check their specific location, I should say, once a week. And I listed several things that I was going to ask the steward to check. One was, you know, that there were enough books, or that there were enough the right kind of books. Um, and to come to the library and get other donated books, if they were needed. And then the other was to notify me if there were any maintenance issues, if anything was uh, happening that we needed to fix. I did not ask the stewards to commit to actually being responsible for the maintenance. Many of them said that they would, uh, just because, again, uh, I was dealing with some very generous people. And uh, those who felt that they would be adequate to that task said, oh, you know, if there's something, I'll just take care of it. Now, I should say, um, it would be difficult at this point to give a, 
a very thorough answer to some of these questions because if, you'll, if you will recall the timeline, these were only installed in October of this year, or of this, this, this season, I should say, last October. So, you know, this hasn't been actually rolling that long, and I, my deadline for getting them installed was October because I was taking this job in Michigan in November. So I kind of handed this, this project over. I felt like I was giving my baby up for adoption a little bit and, and said, here, I, this is, these are all the details. This is, this is everything that I can give you to help you make this a success. And now you can take it and you can take it in, in all the directions that you choose. Uh, but the short answer to your question is that the school keeps an eye on it and lets the library know. Well, it sounds as if we've got a good um, uh, inspiration to, to encourage someone else to give us a program next year so we can see how it all went. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and from the looks of the Twitter feed, you, you definitely have inspired yeah. some folks to, to give some, that sort of project a try. So, Hope, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, you spending the time with us and, like I said, uh, very inspirational um, thing there.